Welcome to Business Resilience Decoded. I am your host, Vanessa Von Matthews, the Founder and Chief Resilience Officer of Esfalis Advisors. Today, I'm very excited. We're going to be talking to Malcolm Reed. He's the Managing Director with Bryson, and we're going to be talking about recovery in the Caribbean. Uh, but here's why I, I'm excited. Um, I, I met Malcolm, I guess, a year or two now ago from a mutual friend and he kept telling me there's somebody in the business continuity space that you need to know and I was at the DRJ conference and I was talking to this guy the whole time and had no idea that this was the person that I should be connecting to <laughs> so um, Malcolm is a thought leader he is a business owner he is a husband he is a colleague he's a friend his expertise is vast and um, it covers multiple disciplines and areas. And he is also from the Caribbean. And so we thought who other to have join us on today's podcast than Malcolm. So Malcolm, welcome. How are you? I'm fine, Vanessa. And thank you for having me on your show. Absolutely. So you have a lot of experience. You're involved in a lot of organizations. I was actually skimming your, your uh, LinkedIn a couple of days ago and I said, I don't know how he does it, but I can only commit to one board. <laughs> but you're effective in so many different things that you do. So can you just tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and how you landed in risk and business continuity? So for me, it was a the long journey that started a, a while ago. I was actually interested in becoming an engineer. That's what I studied at West Point. I applied for a role as an engineering manager at a telecommunications company. But the company felt that I should have uh, much more hands-on experience. So they offered me another role. They wanted to take a chance with me as a security manager. So I was like, hey, I'll, I'll do it. As a young, bright-eyed, bushy tail, I, I was ready to accept that role. And just around that time, not that I'm trying to date myself here, but Y2K was an issue, you know? And I got involved in Y2K preparedness. And that started my immersion into this field of uh, preparedness, risk, and, and business continuity. So I started looking for other projects in the company that were very, very focused on those fields as well and to expand into other, other projects. So that's, that's who I am. That's the way I'm wired as well. I'm wired for risk management. That's how I think about just even the simplest thing. Those who know me would, would know exactly what I'm talking about. I see risk in, in so many different things, but it's, it's not just about risk mitigation. It, it's really about optimizing. How can something good come out of that situation as well? That's how I think. It's spot on because risk is not just hazard, but it's a whole lot of opportunity too. It's just a matter of how do yes. you take that opportunity and you know move forward with it. So my mom told me one day, she said, uh, when all the racial equity stuff kind of kicked off in the US, she said, when, when white people sneeze, black people catch a cold. Right. And I said, okay, so I'm going to use an, another analogy. When the United yeah. States sneezes, I feel like the Caribbean catches the flu. So looking back, uh, so now we're in 2021, looking back at the pandemic, the supply chain shortages, unemployment, the healthcare issues, reduced flights, the impact to, to uh, tourism, the fight for racial justice, um, and how that movement reached globally, um, how has the Caribbean weathered the many storms that we have experienced over the past year to include a pretty dynamic hurricane season? Yes, uh, that, and that's a, I hope I can answer that question in that short space of time. There's so much to, to unpack in, but I'll, I'll choose a, a couple of things. The natural disasters in the Caribbean are becoming much more frequent and much more um, ferocious in their impact as well. You know, if I just put COVID aside for a while, um, you know, Recent disasters have been much more powerful hurricanes, and you see hurricanes back to back and causing widespread disruption and destruction. For example, one of the islands in the Caribbean, Dominica, which is different from the Dominican Republic, Dominica suffered damages amounting to almost 225%, I think, of their GDP when, when Hurricane Maria hit. And um, that means it'll take Dominica the total output five years to recover to pre-hurricane levels, five years just to get back to where they were. So the, the impact on a small island state is, is tremendous from weather-related events. Of course, the this, this Caribbean is also in a, in a seismic region as well. And of course, you just mentioned and the, the, the elephant in the room here, COVID, with most Caribbean economies, they hinge on tourism. So reduced flights means reduced tourism. 
and people are not you know traveling and not and then of course people are losing jobs and all of that less spending as well less vacation in those areas so caribbean countries have to think out of the box um, I, I think most of us would have seen the first island i believe to come out with it was barbados where they said come to barbados for one year and work work through covid that type of thinking where caribbean islands are not providing an opportunity for people to come live and work here in, in paradise, as they say. Uh, in, the, in the Caribbean, most of the islands are smaller. So think of them as much more nimble. Think of them as like mice, you know, compared to an elephant. They can move much more quickly. They can respond quickly. So I think that has helped the Caribbean islands to respond to COVID. In a Caribbean country can say, you know what, our, our numbers are going up. Let's lock down our borders right now. The U.S. can't really do that. That type of way. The, the speed at which they can respond and the actions that they can take could help in terms of minimizing outside threats coming in, especially from a perspective of a pandemic. And, and the other issues are uh, Caribbean people are quite resilient. Most of them are independent. So that mindset is really embedded in the people. If someone is not accustomed to doing less with more, it becomes difficult to be able to thrive in a very stressful situation. So Caribbean people are wired to be able to thrive in those types of stressful situations. You know, if you were at corporate and you said do more with less, they would look at you like you're crazy, right? Well, yes. <laughs> corporate says that all the time, but but the employees are like, uh, no, sir. But in, yes. in this sense, it's what allows them or enables them to be resilient, to your point, yes. to have the mindset. And uh, the other key word I heard you say was that they're nimble. So they've yes, got some strategic advantages just by how they're positioned and, and from a culture perspective that other large economies don't have readily available. Right, right. I hope I said more with less. Did I say that? Or if not, it was a Freudian slip because it's more, you do more with less. Yes, sir. So, you know, thinking about what you talked about with Barbados, which is pretty interesting. My uh, stepdad is actually Bayesian. So uh, oh. my family goes there a couple times a year. So one thing I noticed is when folks started to get a little bit more comfortable traveling, some folks started to go to the Caribbean. And what was great to see is they had nowhere near the amount of cases and the amount of challenges with COVID-19 as America did, right? So yeah. um, that kind of leads me into my next question. In what ways uh, did the Caribbean have a better response than the United States or some of the other larger countries um, as, as it relates to the events of 2020? Once you have an infection spreading within a community or a larger community population, response is key. If you have to think about something and, and go through a long process, you're wasting valuable time. So the Caribbean countries are much smaller and, and more nimble and able to make those types of decisions with respect to the COVID. And, and also, if you look, I'm a systems thinker, so I try to think of everything and how it interrelates and, you know, to, in terms of an impact. Um, people live in, you know, in, in individual homes. When you, when you look at some areas, the height of pandemic was, was really high in New York. A lot of people live in, in very condensed areas. The Caribbean is a little bit different. The, the population density would be, not that some places won't be like that, but um, in general, the population density is not that high in terms of that much concentrated. So the number of interactions one person would have would be theoretically less. And, and again, it has a lot to do with quick action, on the part of uh, the Caribbean leaders with respect to that. But that makes total sense. You mentioned a couple moments ago that tourism is a huge driver. So in thinking about that, what ways do you see the tourism industry changing in the Caribbean? You alluded to what Barbados has already did in, in 2020 when this whole thing first kicked off. Um, but also what's the global impact that you see from a tourism perspective? I see that as uh, the future of work, you know, and all under that umbrella of the future of work um, in, in the sense that we are now bringing professionals to the doorstep, having the right infrastructure in terms of, um, you know, internet access and all that kind of stuff will be able to enable professionals to do what they do on a day-to-day -day basis in paradise. I think from a global perspective, there are people from the UK go to, as you mentioned, Barbados, you talk about Barbados, and people from the Netherlands go to Aruba and um, Bonnet and Curacao, the ABC Islands. Um, there's a the French, um, French island, Martinique, you know, where I'm from, Trinidad and Tobago is an energy producer. So we have lots of uh, business development there. So again, marrying business a lot more with tourism, I think is very important. So yes, people are going for 
meetings and whatever, but they can also go there for R and R. They could go there and you know swimming with pigs in the Bahamas or flamingos in Aruba, or having fun during carnival or just enjoying a peaceful waterfall in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, there's something for everyone in the Caribbean. I think that's the message that they, that the Caribbean leaders would want to say. This is a place that you can now come here and work with connectivity. Now people are accustomed working from different places. I think it provides a great opportunity because a lot, a lot of the islands also have fairly robust infrastructure as well. They have, you know, uh, 4G, 4 to 5G. Um, they, they, they're on top of the technology as well, and they're providing that, that opportunity. So tourism itself will change globally by bringing people to converge in that region. Did you say swimming with pigs in the Bahamas? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a particular island in the Bahamas where the water is crystal clear, but there are pigs in the water. It's not like you're swimming like, you know, with them, literally, but they're there. And it's, uh, it's, it's beautiful. Google it. It's, um, it's amazing. It's like looking at water in a glass. It's an amazing place. Um, lots of people go there. Lots of celebrities go there all the time. I guess with their, you know, their shades and their hats. Giant, they all go to that chain of islands that, that they can swim with pigs. And as you know, flamingos in Aruba. But, uh, but I wanted to just touch on one thing, as you mentioned, how is it, uh, the industry changing? I didn't mention the flip side of it, not to be too long-winded, but um, global warming and rising sea temperatures have the impact of stronger and more devastating storms and the impact of like uh, the sargassum seaweed, which has affected the Caribbean like in 2018. When that sargassum piles up on the beach, it, it begins to rot and smell. And um, again, the warming of the oceans and, and, and storms and all of that have, has an impact on all of those things. So I think building a resilient economy means that addressing some of these issues of global warming and other types of issues as well. You can't get away from that conversation, especially if in the Caribbean. The Caribbean has a greater susceptibility to the impact of global warming from rising sea levels and stronger storms. And again, as I mentioned, the Sargassum seaweed, which can decimate tourism industry. Absolutely. What's so ironic about that is uh, we were talking about that earlier, you know, the terms of what's a gray rhino, right? And which one of these right. events would be a gray rhino. And so from my perspective, global warming is the next thing that's staring us right in the face. And if we oh, don't yeah. do something, then, then, then we'll be in a very different state than we probably don't want to see. Um, so yep. we could talk to you for hours. You know, you are a very busy man. Uh, where can our listeners find you? Uh, you can find me on, as, as you mentioned earlier, LinkedIn. I'm, I'm very active on LinkedIn. I'm a connector. Here and I'm also on Twitter and I have a Facebook page as well. Um, I love to travel. I love to network, but COVID has made it hard for me since I'm such an outgoing person. As you know, I love to be at conferences and I live, in, I live here in central Virginia. So, if, you know, I'm, that's where I'm based and I, I focus a lot on the security side as well as the business continuity side here with my work at ASIS. And I work with the, the BCI as well. So you can find me at this time on the social media, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook. There you have it. Thanks for tuning in to Business Resilience Decoded with the Disaster Recovery Journal and as Follis Advisors. Subscribe, share, download, and look out for future episodes.